Hello, and welcome to People Keep Dying, the podcast where we talk about people who die. How people keep dying. Wow, I fucked it up this time. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We don't have a tagline. (laughs) I'm your host, Stephanie. And I'm Angela. And welcome to the seventh episode of our podcast. I actually forgot i thought this was episode six oh. and i was gonna be like angela we made it past our five and yeah I was so we, made, we made it way past our five uh yeah. but we made it past that so it's because i post i tech you, you you do the audio cutting but i post all the stuff so yeah I, i've seen it last and more more recently I'm, but i mean that should only mean that i should know that it was episode six because i just edited that and titled it exactly so <laughs> i should remember i don't know why i didn't uh. connect those dots so, um, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, so we're actually doing a double recording today because I'm going to be going on a vacation. I know. So, so if so, the audio quality sucks on this episode, it'll suck it just as equally suck. on the next episode. I apologize. I listened to our first episode. It won't <sighs> suck. Dude. <laughs> Number three is the one that I'm like, oh, we shouldn't have ever released this. We should not have released that at all. I was in, I'm embarrassed. No, three, like one and two were like our testers. Three was like us being like, I think this is going to work. And then yeah. four, it's like, okay, you got this now. Yeah. Cause I think on number four, we got the professional setup. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Cause I think we tried three weeks of different we, we things. did. Yeah. We tried different things. We tried different things. But then by no, by three we had this, but we didn't move here until four. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But it work. It doesn't matter because then matter. it just shows our progress to whoever even listens to one at this exactly. point. Exactly. I mean, a lot of people don't. Don't a lot of people start podcasts at like the w- most recent episode? I don't know. Probably. I mean, who knows? Who knows what they find? Who knows what they find? So yeah. Um. So we were. <laughs> We had we prepared two stories, um, and uh, I'm going to be presenting the my bummer. novel. I'm prevent- presenting a novel. It's a long one, and it's a total bummer. Um, but that's okay because Angela's gonna finish us off. Finish us off with uh, some. It's not like it's still murder. Not, not bummery. It's not. <laughs> it's, it's still kind of a bummer, but it's. I don't know. It's only one person. Yeah, only one person dies, so that's not... Oh, I mean, that's better than my story. Yeah. I mean, that's better than both my stories, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so my story takes place in the 1970s, which um, I will be completely straight up and honest. I don't I don't know much about the 70s, uh, other than a lot of people were doing drugs. Yeah. A lot of people were killing people. Like, serial killers were, like, totally on the fucking rise. And, and the end of the 70s was the beginning of the punk era. So. And, like... Well, we're not at the beginning of the 70s. So we're like end of the 60s. It's actually the year is 1970. But hold on a second. I have to go get a pen. <gasps> I'm sorry. All right. Now that Angela's back, I'm not even going to cut that out. I'm going to leave no. that in uh, for everybody. Uh, so people can publicly shame you for not for, being prepared. For my pen dying. Uh, so yeah, like honestly, it's a fucking wonder anybody survived the '60s or the '70s. Like just the things that people were doing at the time. I mean, people survived a lot of things, you know, World War One, World War Two. Yeah, II. but I mean, <laughs> that wasn't like I mean, as much as that was like idiocy. I mean, like I feel like idiocy was on the rise in the '60s and '70s because of all the drugs. Yeah, there was a lot of drugs. There's and it a was lot like, of drugs in World and War Two. It was like designer drugs. Yeah. Well, World War Two is sort of what created all the drugs. Yeah, but I mean, all the drugs that kind of yeah. So all of these drugs were created in World War Two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I everything that Hitler documentary. Yeah, and everything that sort of came up from that. It's surprising to me that the sixties and the seventies people survived. Well, it's surprising. Like, it's not actually. It's surprising that there's so many functioning adults at this point because we were all born. Were they functioning? Because I mean, these are our grandparents, and if you don't think generational trauma exists, like. Let me tell you. My grandma's still alive. She seems pretty good. 96. I mean, she's old. I mean, now. like, but yeah. oh, wow, that's, like, way older. My grandma's only, like, 70. My my dad turned 70 next year. Dang. So. <laughs> he was getting it into an old age. Yeah. I was Damn. born when he was, like, 36. You know what? That's 
No, that doesn't even sound like that's that Yeah, because, I mean, like, him having a kid but when he's in that age, But oh, at that time, like, well, people were popping out babies at, like, 17, 18, 19, 20. I'm the youngest, right? So, yeah. yeah. Welcome to being the baby. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, before we get into my story's timeline, we got to backtrack a few years to the mid-60s, and we got to talk a little bit about the Vietnam War. And, um... The Vietnam War was a war that no one won. Uh, and and no the one, one wanted. no one wanted it. No one wanted especially it. Especially people in the United States. Um, yeah. Well, I'm I, sure I especially Vietnam, people. The Vietnam, yeah, they didn't want fucking want it was there more, either. The people but, in Vietnam probably yeah. wanted it more, but <laughs> the people in the United States didn't want it. So I'm not going to like give you too much information on the Vietnam War because I know that you probably know a lot. And the I know. Uh, listeners probably, I mean, Don't know if you want to either. know about the Vietnam War, get, it's available on it Wikipedia. But, The TLDR uh, on the Vietnam War is that North and South Vietnam governments were at war, and the North Vietnamese army was supported by the Soviet Union and China and other communist allies, and then the Southern Vietnamese army was supported by the United States, South Korea, Australia, Thailand, and other anti-communist allies. So it was basically like the communists versus the anti-communists, and the anti-communists were just like, we don't fucking want communism anymore. Like, get out of here. Like... Go all way. We just want to wipe you the fuck out. Um, the war lasted roughly like 19 years, and it also caused civil wars in both Laos and Cambodia, which resulted in all three countries eventually becoming communist states in 1975. So, I mean, the communists fucking won regardless, which... <sighs> fuck communism. Um, so... The majority of Americans uh, at the time believed that the war was unjustified uh, and didn't want any part of it yep. because realistically it was. The, essentially, depending on who side you were on, uh, a lot of people looked at the war was actually, it was origin, it was called in Vietnam, uh, the Vietnam War, is called the resistance of America. So like they were all upset about like how Americans had come in and joined forces with like France or some shit like that. And yeah. It was just like, we don't like you. Get out of here. You're coming in and you're doing all this shit. And America was like, they were fucking like, we're so badass. And they were like, you're a baby. Yeah. Like, get out of here with your like, I've only been a country for less than a hundred years. Um, Actually, no, at that point, it's been more than a hundred years. More than it doesn't matter. Years. You're a baby country. Yeah. Shut up. Uh. <laughs> Oh my god. Okay, so uh, the majority, majority of Americans believe the war was unjustified. Uh, they didn't want the war when Kennedy started sending in the troops. They didn't want the war when Johnson became president um, and started sending in more troops yep. because uh, war gets money. A lot of money. A lot, A of, lot money. of money. Uh, and who doesn't love money more than white men? Everyone. Not more than a white man, I don't think. Anyways. That's sexist and racist, and I apologize. Sorry, all white male <laughs> listeners. So uh, in 1968, Nixon uh, ends up winning the presidency on the promise that he will end the Vietnam War. And, well... <laughs> Did you know Nixon's a piece of shit? We all, know, we all know how well Nixon's presidency went. And uh, Real good. So uh, Nixon becomes president. War is still raging. People are still unhappy, and people keep dying. And then in November 1969, the May Lai Massacre gets exposed in the American media. Do you know what that one is? No. The May Lai Massacre? Okay. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. This might be a little long-winded, but it's important because it's history. Because it's history. It's gruesome. It leads to what actually ends up happening in the story. So a group of American soldiers called the Charlie Company was ordered to go in and wipe out the remaining forces of the 48th National Liberation Front. Um, who allegedly were hiding in the Mison village area. And I apologize if I'm saying that wrong. I don't know how to say anything in yeah. Vietnamese. So. Uh, but basically, it, it goes like this. So Colonel Henderson goes to his officers and he's like, go in there aggressively, close with, close with the enemy, and wipe them out for good. And then one of those officers goes to his battalion and says, burn them all. Burn all the houses, kill all the livestock, destroy the food supplies, and destroy the walls. And kill the children? And it's just, no. Oh, okay. Kill the children wasn't, yeah, it's not there. Not yet. Okay. okay. So, uh, burn the houses, kill the livestock. And it's just sort of like, that's quite the ex- escalation. Now, I've yeah. never been 
in I've a war. I've never been in a war. Uh, you know. I've never been in the army. Yeah. Um, I imagine the mindset. I mean, even in the seventies, the mindset of what they were sort of dealing with was probably fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, but I still feel like that's a little aggressive to like go in there and like it feels, do, do all of that. Like it, burn it, the houses, kill the livestock, destroy the food supplies, and destroy the wells. Like it feels like what they used to do when they used to like pillage villages, you know? Yeah, like back which, in the day. Which is exactly not in what the seventies. Yeah. This feels way too recent to be doing this mm-hmm. kind of shit, but so uh, on March 15th, at a Charlie Company briefing, uh, Captain Medina, and this dude's a total piece of shit, uh, tells his men that nearly all the civilian residents in the village would have left by the market by 7 a.m., and that anyone who remained uh, would be the National Liberation Front members or their sympathizers. So he was basically like... Very generalizing. Uh, so everyone's going to be gone by 7. So anything that's left there, like... Kill them. They're bad people. Yeah. You so can kill, kill them. them. Yeah. Uh, so which is some, totally not true, but okay. Some level headed soldier was like, Hey, uh, no, like, uh, does that include like women and children? Like who's the enemy here? And so, uh, different people gave different accounts. Cause this is all sort of retold through, uh, like the court like who actually testified as yeah. to what actually happened after it got exposed. Um, so people gave different accounts of what Medina responded with. Um, some testified that the orders as they understood them was that they were to kill all guerrilla and North Vietnamese combatants and suspects and to burn the village and pollute the wells. And it's just sort of like, you guys are fucking soldiers. These are soldiers. These are people who are told a command and told to do a command. Yeah. And it, in a fucking scandal like this, which it was a huge scandal, I would not be surprised if a bunch of soldiers were told what to say. Yeah. How to say it and, like, whatever. And they're going to do what they're told yeah. because they're they're soldiers and that's what they're told to do. So You some train people... them to follow order without question a lot of the time. Yeah. So others quoted him as saying, um, anybody that's running from us, hiding from us, or appear to be the enemy, if a man is running, shoot him. Sometimes if it's a woman with a rifle running, shoot her. One witness even testified that Medina ordered them to destroy anything in the village that was walking, crawling, or growing. Um, So the following morning on Saturday morning, March 16th at 7.30 a.m., around 100 soldiers from the Charlie Company entered the village and slaughtered everything. And it was atrocious and completely horrific, and everything and everyone died. Um, so they, so uh, all the livestock was just destroyed as well. They basically went in and killed everything. Like they set everything on fire. Uh, they they killed all of the livestock. Um, I don't understand why you would kill livestock. I don't. I don't know why they would kill. Why would you poison the walls? Like that's not. Like, you're killing civilians. You they have 100% care. extra. Yeah, they, yeah. they know. Um, and this was shortly, like, this is pretty shortly after World War II where we called everything they did an abomination, right? Yeah. So, yeah. wow. Yeah, Good. which is why this is as bad as it is. So, yeah. they go in at, so, now, remember, they went in at 7.30 to avoid, to essentially, quote-unquote, avoid uh, killing mass civilians. Mm-hmm. Um, well, they continued killing everybody until 11 o'clock that night which means that not only did they kill like the women and the babies that were at home because they hadn't gone to the market Mm -hmm. which they did and there were some if you guys want to i left all of this out but there are some really gruesome accounts um from soldiers about what they were doing to the women and children Mm -hmm. um and it was really bad and so the people that were at the market when they were coming back, they also uh, were killed. Um, one soldier uh, reported that like most of the killings happened on security sweeps much later in the afternoon, where they would basically go around, and that's when they started killing the livestock and the women and the children and the elderly. Um, so that, so yeah, so they basically were killing everything that they saw until eleven o'clock at night, when Medina finally gave a cease order, cease fire order to quote cut it out, knock it off. And that was only after, um, I think it was uh, a Corporal Thompson 
reported that there were civilian casualties. So, so it sounds like it sounds like Medina probably got a medal for this after. Oh he did. yes, yeah, uh, he, he did. Right? did get issued a letter of commendation uh, a couple weeks later they for get the purple attack. Heart too. Uh, no, oh, uh, wow, because he was given the letter because he killed uh, 128 Viet Cong partisans. So he killed tw- 128 bad if guys. You kill thousands of people. You'll probably kill a couple uh, of bad ones. Okay, yeah. So killing civilians is uh, supposedly like a big no-no. It's okay in war. Uh, no, no, no. It's no? usually oh. it's usually frowned upon. They okay. they try to minimize as much, but sure. um, I don't really assume that they're doing that for their own like you know peace of mind. I'm sure it's just for optics. Yeah, like it just looks bad when you kill civilians. Yeah. And, um, because again, because it was after, you know, world war two, um, and so many people were opposed to this war to begin with, you can't go fucking in there and blowing up a whole bunch of civilians because people are bad. Like the war yeah. was already being protested like so much. So it was terrible. Um, also owing to the chaotic circumstances of the war and for whatever reason, the U S army decided not to take any definitive body counts for non-combatants in Vietnam. Oh. Like how do you, as a fucking country just decide, Hey, you know what? We're not going to take any, like to me, that sounds like you plan to go in there and just fucking slaughter everything and then be able to walk out without taking any records. Like, I mean, I feel like that's what happened during like everything. Re- more recent wars. Yeah, like it's just So yeah, they didn't take any n- numbers, so there were actually it can't be confirmed no. how many people uh actually died at Melai. Um but estimates vary from 347 to 504. Uh, being the most cited figures. The memorial at the site of the massacre lists 504 names with ages ranging from 1 to 82. Uh, a later investigation into the from the U.S. Army arrived at a much lower figure of 347, which uh-huh. of course they fucking did. Of course. Like, because 300, not that 347 is any much better, but like it's a shit ton better than 504 because now the news articles can say over 500. Yeah. Like, so, uh, local, the official estimates for the local government still saying it's a 504, but mm-hmm. keep in mind, they killed 500. So it's estimated that they killed 504. From ages one to 84? Yeah. 82. 82. One to 82. So, I mean, they, they knew when they killed that one year old, I'm pretty sure that that kid was not in the Viet Cong. Uh, yeah, I like I'm should have known that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, they probably should have. Yeah. Um, so initial reports, uh, given by the commanders or whoever the fuck writes up these reports, uh, claim that only 22 civilians were killed. Uh huh. Um, sure. why? Because they tried to cover it up because of like, course. optics. You know how bad uh, it would look? Yeah. Oh my God. So, because like they killed, uh, they only killed 128 bad guys. But then they went and killed 504 innocent people. Like, there's no way that you can fucking ever justify that. No. But if you say 22 died. Yeah, it's like, oh, that's oh, a yeah, that's oh, casualty only, of yeah. war. You know, that's what you like say. Like, one in every five. Like, that's okay. Yeah, like, that's whatever. not, but still. There's yeah. only 22, like, people. And there they was weren't a women one-year-old... and children. It was just, was. like, you know, just some older gentlemen that really weren't a part. They were just sympathizers. Yeah. Like, it's such trash. So, um, and so they try to cover it up. It gets covered real deep um but a couple of some of the soldiers because they they saw some it? sick shit like yeah. there was some sick shit going on uh he writes a letter and the letter gets ignored it gets passed around in congress uh congress members ignore it blah 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 uh but eight months later on november 12th 1969 an independent investigative journalist uh seymour hirsch breaks a story and the American media goes fucking bananas yeah. as it does because like, they were already against a war. Yeah. So, and now it's like, wow, Americans are brutal. Cause these weren't like, it's one thing as shitty as it is. It's one thing if other countries are doing this because that's what they do. And yeah. that's how they're that's pitching it to the Americans. Yeah. Is these people are bad and they're going around and killing them. These weren't bad people. These were Americans. These yeah. were supposed to be the quote unquote good guys that had just fucking massacred this village for for what? Like literally no for reason. literally no reason. It's so upsetting. <sighs> okay, so 
Uh, public opposition for the war obviously increased. Yep. Um, and in December, the nature of the draft changes, and they eliminate deferments allowed in prior draft processes, which then starts affecting many college students and teachers. So basically, they're like, yeah, you know what? You're going to come do this fucking war. We're going to start Even sending off. Even though you don't want to yeah. be in this war. Yeah. And, yeah. and they're making it so that you can't defer. Yeah. So, like, how the fuck did Trump get out of this? Money. Money. Um, I'm pretty sure, like, a lot of rich people didn't have to go do it. No. That's you just, how it you, is. If yeah. you have a lot of money, you can come up with excuses and you have connections and mm-hmm. everything else. Mm-hmm. So, it, it starts affecting the colleges. Yeah. Well, uh, across the U.S., campuses erupt in protests, uh, which t- time called a nationwide student strike. Uh, people were pissed, especially the younger generations, of course. Yeah. Because... It's They're the, the fucking, ones who are paying for a yeah. war that they didn't want to be in to yes. begin with. And it's not even that. It's also like these are people that were p- born during World War II. Yeah. Like they've already lived and have like have heard the stories and now like they're growing up. And so – now they're off fucking in another war and like they're like we don't want to fucking do this like stop doing this we yeah. have no reason to be over there yeah they, like, like nobody wanted to be in this fucking war it's so i nobody wants to be in any war the uh, government except, does well yeah except That's... the people that want something that they shouldn't have like yeah <sighs> Anyways, so, uh oh yeah that's it for the may lie massacre okay. uh, i know that was a little long-winded but uh yeah, it's kind of like a little twofer. We get two little massacres in one story. Um, so uh, colleges are erupting in protests all over the place. And one of the campuses, uh, Kent State University, um, they were protest- protesting this war in particular. And uh, they had actually been protesting for a while. Uh, so just when it seems like the war is about to wind down, uh, on April 30th, 1970, Nixon announces that the United States combat forces have invaded Cambodia. Uh, uh, and this pissed off a lot yeah. of fucking people uh, who believed that this was only going to exacerbate the conflict. They were just like, I thought you were fucking pulling out. So yeah. why are you approving some invasion? Why are you going to Cambodia? What the fuck did they have to do with any like what are you doing nixon oh that's right fucking up the government forever thanks for all of the trauma you caused nixon forever forever god we're still reeling from this one um so the following day friday may 1st at kent state university a demonstration is being held uh with 500 students the crowds the crowd starts to disperse to attend their classes they start planning for another rally to be held uh on monday um may 4th to continue the protest of the expansion of the vietnam war into cambodia so they're just like hey you know what come back on friday or come back on monday we're gonna have another protest blah 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 blah. um because people were really angry and i mean protesting was all the rage yeah it was i mean it was pre internet that's what they did for fun these riots sound very similar to like how people are acting now like it's yeah. it's it's so parallel and it's like wow we really haven't like, changed haven't changed at all. it's so crazy to us that these were like these were our like parents slash grandparents yeah who were like doing all this badass stuff um a sign was put on a tree asking why the rotc building was still standing uh which is the reserve officers training corps so i guess they used to have like a training building there for the war and they wanted it they were like why is this still here get rid of it we don't even fucking we want nothing to do with this war. yeah um that evening uh after drinking all afternoon and getting all riled up as people do in the 70s they do uh, that now they, they they still do it now but in the 70s it was like the thing yeah uh people start leaving the bars and uh, they begin throwing beer bottles at police cars and breaking down storefronts yeah. so a little bit of a riot starts going yeah. on yeah but these idiots in the fucking process uh decide to break a bank window and set off an alarm and whether or not they were trying to steal money from a bank i don't, I don't know but they yeah. broke a bank window set off an alarm uh the news started spreading really quickly and it resulted in all of the rest of the bars sort of closing down uh as a way to like avoid trouble because people were getting a little rowdy so uh basically by the time the other bars had like started shutting down their shit other people had joined in the streets and it was just fucking mass pa- panic and there was a lot of vandalism it's all it's a lot of like mob mentality too, yeah. right yeah and it's like yeah it was like 
back in the day where people were angry and it was like you had it was a college campus right like it's a college town so you're getting a lot of college guys that are probably like sitting around drinking like with all their buddies angry and then playing the telephone game yeah why not so by the time the police arrived a crowd of 100 people 120 people had gathered uh some people from the crowd lit a small bonfire in the streets the crowd uh, appeared to be a mix of bikers students and transient people um you know like hooligans not good not good (laughs) (laughs) a few uh, members of the crowd began to throw beer bottles at the police again uh started yelling obscenities at them uh the entire uh, kent police force was called to duty as well as count uh officers from the county and other surrounding communities to help uh, reel them all back. Uh, the mayor, uh, Leroy Satrom, sorry uh-huh. if I spelled your last name wrong, not spelled, said, uh, declared a state of emergency and called the office of the Ohio governor, Jim Rhodes, to seek assistance and ordered all the bars closed. Um, That's not going to do anything. Yeah. And basically the, their, the governmental order to close down the bars pissed off everybody else because well, they were like... Yeah. Fuck the government. Why are you trying to, why are you ruining our lives? Now you're going to take our fun away from us after you're taking our lives. Like There's people who weren't against everything that was going on who were just going to the bars, but then you took away literally their only thing yeah. they love in life. And then it's yeah. like, well, now you got those people also pissed off at you. Yeah. Um, so uh, the police eventually succeeded in using tear gas to disperse the cloud, crowd Ugh. from downtown, forcing them to move several blocks back to the campus. So they finally dispersed. That was Friday. Now we're on to Saturday. Uh, City officials and downtown businesses began receiving threats and rumors uh, began spreading that radical revolutionaries are in Kent to destroy the city and the university. Several merchants reported that they were told that if they did not display anti-war slogans, their businesses would be burned down. So a lot of like businesses were super concerned. Yeah. Um, Kent's police chiefs told the mayor that according to a reliable informant, the art, OTC building, uh, the one back on campus, um, the local army recruitment station and the post office were being targeted for destruction that night. Why the post office? Uh, probably to like disrupt mail, like just disrupting the mail, disrupting order chaos. Yeah. Like for whatever reason, maybe not so much now because we have the internet, but doing anything to a post office was a big fucking deal. Yeah. Like. It is still now. Yeah. Yeah. But not as much now, I would imagine. Um, well, then Amazon's going to have drones soon, so we won't have to deal with people anymore. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I can only wish. So there were rumors of students with caches of uh, guns and uh, that they plotted and that they were plotting to poison the local water supply with LSD. Um, and that the students were building underground tunnels uh, for the purpose of blowing them up in the main towns, like, in the main town. Here's some very, like, elaborate... I mean, the idea to poison local wall supply, supply with LSD, like, that was that like something that they were doing a lot the war, in the 70s? Maybe. Because, like, I have definitely heard about, like, warnings about that before where people were threatening with that in, like, other situations. Yeah. Mayor Satram met with Kent City officials and a representative of the Ohio Army National Guard. And because of all the rumors and threats, uh, Satram believed that the local officials would not be able to handle uh, all the disturbances that were going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he requested for the National Guard to be sent to Kent. Um, And eventually they showed up uh, five hours later. Uh, But by this time, a large demonstration was already going on in the campus and the ROTC building was on fire. Uh, An FBI investigation ended up showing that the arsonists were likely not Kent students um, uh, and that the evidence suggested that the building fire was likely pre-planned because, quote, railroad flares, machetes, and ice picks are not usually customarily carried to peaceful rallies. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah machetes and ice picks probably aren't just like oh no. just like yeah. heading down to the little rally with yeah. my like usually you throw equipment. rocks if like you're you know yeah. it gets violent for, for sure there's always shit starters in every protest regardless of what side you're in there's yeah. always shit starters there were reports that some kent firemen and police officers were struck with rocks and other objects like you said 
uh, which is how I people were probably just picking up rocks. Uh, while they attempted to extinguish the blaze, several fire engine companies had to be called because protesters carried the fire hose into the commons and slashed it. The National Guard made numerous arrests, mostly for curfew violations, and used tear gas. At least one student was slightly wounded with a bayonet. And that concludes day two. Yay! This is uh, super fun. <laughs> Everyone, yep. Everyone's having a great time. Everyone's just partying up. I can't even um, like. It's it's just you understand the circumstances of like you you get all this shit and then you like mix it together in like a balloon and then you pop it and then you're like surprised that shit gets everywhere. And you're yeah. like, Well, you know. I don't know why I keep yawning. I'm so sorry to anybody if I can't edit this out. Like, I don't know why. I'm I listened so to tired. one of our podcasts and then, like, you yawned and then I yawned and then they kept, they kept yawning at each other. Did <laughs> we? Why do I not? Why did I not? It's, it was very, like, it was like, uh, you'll, like, be talking. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I'm trying to hide it, but it's okay. Yeah. So, on Sunday, May 3rd, uh, Governor Rose gives a press conference at a Kent firehouse where he calls the student protesters un-American and referred to them as revolutionary set on destroyer, uh, set on destroying the higher education in Ohio. I like how it, it, everyone's always called un-American if it goes against yes. what the government wants you yes. to do, even though it's like, were we un-American when we started a revolution against, you know, the English? How start? American were you when you were slaughtering 504 fucking civilians a couple days before? How American were we when we came into America and killed all the Native Americans? Exactly, when you were slaughtering those people. Yeah. Like, that's what America's founded on. So, <laughs> like, this what? is actually pretty American. I yeah. Think. I would, actually, I, would actually, I would actually say the protesters are being very un-American, and good for them. Yeah. Yeah, so the governor was like, these students are the fucking problem. And it's like, the students, now, granted, they were getting a little out of control, but no, they're not the problem. No. Uh, so this is his quote from his uh, press conference. We are going to eradicate the problem. We're not going to treat the symptoms. These people are just to move from one campus to another and terrorize the whole community. They're worse than the brown shirts, which is Nazis, uh, and the communist element, and also the night riders, which is the KKK, good. and the vigilantes. Like, he's saying that these fucking students are worse than Nazis and the KKK. Well, are you kidding me right now? Isn't that what's going on now? So... Yeah, I mean, they're still doing it. They're still uh, fucking doing uh, it. Like, I don't think anybody should I, be comparing anything to the Nazis. The Nazis yeah. are Nazis. But, um, I mean, it seems so... Like, that's just what the government does, you know, yeah. to discount whatever you believe. Mm -hmm. If you're younger and you believe the opposite of what they want you to believe, they're always like, well, you're worse than the Nazis or you're worse than the KKK. And it's yeah. like, you can't be worse than them. Yeah. Uh, they're the, so he said that they're the worst type of people that we harbor in America, which, I mean... Is that not what Donald Trump fucking says about like literally Mexicans? Every, anyone that's every, not white, all of them. I think he said that about the Chinese. Yeah, because he's trying anyone to keep that's Chinese not white. students out of school now too. Which, sure, <sighs> you know? like, it's so upsetting. Um, la 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 la. Uh, now, I want to say this. They are not going to take over this campus. I think that we're up against the strongest, well-trained, militant, revolutionary group that has ever assembled in America. So, oh first of all, he's saying that these guys are like, he's saying these students are, nobodies. Are, like, are like nobodies. They're worse than like Nazis and stuff like that. And then he, like, he's basically saying that they're the most well-trained. These are students. Yep. They burnt down one building and suddenly they're like the most well-trained revolutionary group ever assembled in America. They had the fucking civil war and he's now going, he's saying that these students are more trained and worse than the civil war. Yeah. Like my God, I just, <laughs> ah. and the thing is like, if you say it with enough passion, a lot of people will believe you. If you say something with a lot of authority and passion, people will start believing you. And that's what scares me. Like, I'm sure, like, the climate of everything was just so fucking hostile. And I'm sure, like, in the news, they were like, these kids are so bad, they're destroying everything. And people were believing it because, yeah. like, the media 
is fucking scary and they use buzzwords and the whole they just direct like they just feed into the fear so anyways uh governor Rhodes was in my opinion um the worst he wasn't the worst. Uh, no. The dude from before was the oh, fucking yeah. worst. But, yeah, he, yeah, I mean, yeah. he was pretty bad. Like, I don't think... But at the same time, like, I don't know what they were actually doing. And maybe they were... Like, these people were I highly really bad, doubt but they like, were in the same category as yeah. Nazis. No. I mean, but... it's shitty that they were trashing this, the buildings. Well, yeah. I, 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 I never like, condoned that. But at yeah. the same time, it's like... They're not the worst thing. Yeah. They're kids. This like over they're, exaggeration. Yeah. They but sound it's like, like generational children. thing, right? Yeah. Like they're all like these kids are so entitled and blah blah blah. It's the same shit as having they say now about where the, millennials yeah. all the time. Yeah. When you're just like, oh, but now so... it's the baby boomers. Yeah. So it's like they're complaining about us when they just gone through the same shit. And that's what I find so fucking shocking. And it's just like, why are baby boomers saying shit to us? They've they've been here. They've been on the side. But maybe that's why because they've been like, we've been where you are. And like, get over fucking, it. Yeah, it didn't yeah. fucking work out for us. I so wonder like, if, like, we're going to become, I'm pretty sure we're going to become exactly that jaded. Oh, yeah, we will. Yeah. Our for generation. Sure. It's just like, our generation is going to seem super conservative in comparison to the new generation of children being born. Yeah. Were we? Okay. So, uh, during the day, um, some students came downtown, uh, came to do some cleanup efforts. Um, after the rioting, um, some actions. So basically, yeah. So some kids come down, they decide to do some cleanup and people were like, we don't really want you to come clean up down here. Cause we, you caused this. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of look at it like, if they're coming down, like the to people that are you. coming down you to don't clean know, yeah. aren't the people that did exactly. the rioting. Like these are probably like the good ones. Who, um, who cared about the fact that they destroyed yeah. the building. Not everyone in the riot were going to try to destroy the building a lot yeah. of them were just mad and then they let their anger override whatever was going on but didn't didn't mean that they destroyed the building it just meant no. that they were there yeah um so uh the mayor uh orders a curfew until further notice oh which God. um really fucking totally pissed people unfair. off like they were like you can't fucking tell me when my curfew is i'm like 20 years old like fuck yeah. you um so you can draft me for an army but you I can't. Yeah, leave but the I house can't leave the pen. Pa- no, eight o'clock. Oh my gosh! So uh, around eight o'clock, uh, another rally is held at the campus commons, and by eight forty-five, the guard, the uh, National, uh, National guard. guard, shows up again and use tear gas to disperse the cl- uh, crowd. Um, and the students reassembled at the intersection of Lincoln and Main downtown, holding a sit-in with hopes of gaining a meeting with the mayor. Um, at 11 o'clock, the guard announced that the curfew had gone into, oh, so it was at 11 o'clock for the curfew, uh, curfew had gone into effect and began forcing the students back into the dorms and a couple of students were bayoneted by guards. And that concludes day three. Yeah. Uh, I'm not turning this page yet. I actually have page on day four on a little bit of day four on this page. (laughs) You want to be very dramatic. Yeah. I want to be very dramatic about my day three. Um, okay, so Monday, May 4th. It's only it's been a weekend. That's yes. how long it has gone. Um, so as we know, uh previously that I told you there was going to be a protest scheduled mm-hmm. uh at noon on Monday, and then they had the whole weekend of just like fucking riots and protests everywhere. And so the university officials attempted to ban the gathering. They were like, don't fucking come. They put up a whole bunch of f- f- flyers, they handed out leaflets to all the students and said, Don't you come to this thing. Uh, the event's been canceled. Um, don't come. Uh, despite all of these efforts, 2,000 people showed up. Yeah. Uh, the protest began with the ringing of the campus iron victory bell uh, to mark the beginning of the rally, and the first protester began to speak. Um, and then a bunch of guardsmen showed up. So we had some guards people from companies A and C. Don't know what that means. One 145th Infantry and Troop G of the 2100th Armory Cavalry, as well as money from the Ohio National Guard, units from the campus grounds, uh, and they all showed up to disperse some of the students. Uh, so there was a uh, like wrongful death suit or some shit. Some the legality of all of those guards showing up yeah. was questioned um, to disperse the students, uh, but. Later, uh, the United States of the United States Courts of Appeals, Court of Appeals, uh, ruled that the authorities did indeed have the right to disperse the crowd because, in their opinion, 
they gave enough warning for them to not show up to this. Like they put up flyers. They the school adequately showed that they tried to cancel this event, but yeah. the students showed up anyways, which means that they no longer like they no longer had a right to be there. The school had shut it down. Mm-hmm. Um, I can see where the court of appeals is coming from. Yeah, because it would mean that what, the, all the you know the violence that they showed was wasn't unnecessary but i get the it vi- well we haven't gotten to the violence oh because but i feel like there's gonna be a lot of it yeah <laughs> um but it was just like they basically were like they had no right to disperse the crowd yeah. so everything that happened shouldn't have happened that originally passed but that the appeals and appeals court they were like no they they had adequate yeah time um, the dispersal process began late in the morning with campus patrolman Harold Rice riding in with a National Guard Jeep, approaching the students, uh, read an order of disbursement, like said aloud, like get out of here or go to jail. Mm-hmm. Uh, the processors responded by throwing rocks and they hit one of the patrolmen and then the Jeep left. Mm-hmm. They were forced. The, the Jeep was forced. There's 2000 fucking people. Like I'm sure he was scared. Uh, just before noon, the guard returned and again ordered the crowd to disperse. When most of the crowd refused, uh, the guard started to use tear gas. Uh, because of the wind, the tear gas had little effect on dispersing the crowd. And uh, they started launching a second volley of rocks towards the guard's line and chanted, get these pigs off our campus. Uh, more students lobbed uh, tear gas containers back at the National Guardsmen, but they wore gas masks, so they were unaffected. Yeah. The thing is, like, when you start trying to control an angry crowd with something like that, they're going to fight back. Yeah. That's what happens. And it was, like, unfortunately. No, I could be wrong on this, but tear gas was a new was a new thing. And yeah. Well, because tear gas was created in the war of yeah. World War II. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I imagine that, I mean, it wasn't used it was probably gaining some popularity yeah. in like the sixties and seventies, but it was probably still like, I don't know. I've never been tear gassed. I've never been in a situation where I would need to be, uh, but I imagine it sucks. I always remember are those students in UC Irvine who are, you know, sprayed with pepper spray. That's mm-hmm. all I ever think of whenever I think of any sort of gas dispersal. Yeah. You know, recent history is really shitty, too. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, life is just really shitty. People are just always dying. Uh, When it became clear that the crowd was not going to disperse, 77 National Guards with bayonets fixed on their M1 Grand Garand rifles, whatever. They had fucking bayonets on their rifles. Yeah. Uh, 77 dudes. Uh, They began to advance against the protesters. And as the guardsmen advanced, the protesters retreated up over Blanket Hill, heading out over the common areas. Uh, but once they were over the hill, the students in a loose group moved northeast along the front of Taylor Hall, with some continuing towards the parking lot uh, in front of another hall. Um, and the guardsmen continued to pursue the protesters over the hill, but rather than veering to the left with the rest of the protesters and get them off that way, they continued to walk straight to um, a fence and where there was a chain link fence. And... They were there for about 10 minutes and the witness accounts basically were like these guys just sort of like stood there and they like kind of turned to the side and they kind of turned to the other side and some would sit down and Uh some would get up for like 10 minutes. Um, So they had cleared the protesters from the common areas. Uh, Many students had left, uh, but some some stayed and were still angrily confronting um, the soldiers. Mm -hmm. Some uh, were throwing rocks and tear gas canisters um and after the 10 minutes the guardmen that were down by the fence they just begin uh retracing their steps back up the hill towards the common area so this is really weird because it sort of looked like when they got down to the hill they didn't really know where to go Mm -hmm. or like what to do and so then they were like okay we'll just like walk back up the hill but it was like 10 minutes is a long time in a riot situation um so some of the students uh, on Taylor Hill veranda began to move slowly towards the soldiers as they passed over the top of the hill and headed back towards the commons. Um, during uh, their climb back to the hill, several guardsmen, uh, people reported that several guardsmen stopped and then half turned to keep their eyes on the students that were standing out front of the Princess Hall parking lot. Mm-hmm. At 12.24 p.m., 
according to eyewitnesses, a sergeant named Myron Pyre turned and began firing at the crowd of students with his 45 pistol. A number of guardsmen and then a number of other guardsmen nearest to the students also turned and started firing their rifles at the students. Oh, yep. In total, four students were killed and nine were wound, wounded. Two of the students Two of the students killed were Allison Krauss and Jeffrey Miller. Uh, they were participating in the protest. Allison was shot in the chest and died later in the hospital. Jeffrey was shot right through the mouth and died instantly. Um, the other two, Sandra Schuer and uh, William Knox Schroeder, they had been walking home from class Good. Um, at the time of their deaths. So not so even they weren't in even, the protest. They weren't even in the protest. They had just left class and they were walking home and they were shot. Uh, Sandra was shot in the neck and William was shot in the chest and died later on that day during surgery. Mm-hmm. Uh, of those wounded... Oops, sorry guys. <laughs> My parking's going to expire. No, it's fine. I know, because it's after six. Yeah. Um, the uh, the wounded uh, was Joseph Lewis Jr. He was hit twice in the right abdomen and once in the lower left leg. John R. Cleary was shot in the upper chest, upper left chest. Thomas Mark Grace was struck in the ankle. Alan Michael Canfora was hit in his right wrist. Dean R. Kaler was uh, shot in the back, fracturing his vertebrae and permanently paralyzed from the chest down. Douglas Ann Rentmore was hit in his right knee. Dennis, James Dennis Russell was hit in his right thigh from a bullet and in the right forehead by birdshot. Both wounds were minor. Uh, Robert Fullis Stamps was hit in the right buttocks. Donald Scott McKenzie uh, had a neck wound. Um, at least 29 of the 77 guardsmen claimed to have opened their weapons. Uh, or fired their weapons, and an estimated 67 rounds of ammunition uh, was found. Jesus. And all I can think is, like, 20 fucking seven of you shot, and, like, 67 rounds. So they determined the shooting uh, lasted for 13 seconds, Mm -hmm. although John Kiffner reported uh, to the New York Times that it appeared to go on uh, as a solid volley for perhaps a minute, if not longer. But mm-hmm. I mean, if it's 67 rounds, it definitely wasn't for a whole minute. No. It was probably just the 10 it's seconds. It's super fast, yeah, yeah. But I mean, for someone that's living that, I bet you it felt like yeah. forever. Um, and the question as to why these shots were fired at all um, remains widely debated. So they'll always say like, oh, well, he had a weapon or something. Well, yes, that's exactly what they fucking say. say, So a military chief administrative officer told reporters that a sniper had opened fire, that a sniper had fired on the guardsmen, um, but that Mm -hmm. remained to be a debated allegation because they didn't find any proof of a sniper. Um, But what they did end up later finding was that there was a student who was an FBI informant and apparently he was walking around with a pistol. And so it was sort and I'll, I'll get to this a little bit later where it was sort of like, um, he was planted there yeah, and he caught like to instigate instigate something. So he shot at the guards, an FBI informant shot at the guards and then that, but it's still like, and this is one of those conspiracies that kind of lines up with what may have happened because they would cover this like, shit up. and it's it's one of those like conspiracy. Yeah, it's a huge conspiracy theory, right? Because like, why would why would why would the FBI send a student in to Kent State to yeah. shoot guardsmen to cause this, other than to just be like, hey, you know what? Stop fucking having these college campus like Protests. riots and stuff like that. Yeah, we're get, like something bad always has to, to happen. To discredit but that's, the yeah. whole protest because yeah. then it makes it seem like you just yeah. have radicals instead of students who are just mad who are protesting mm-hmm. if you have people shooting then it's like well these are hooligans and that's what it is but it, and it's also like i can understand how if you had the one guy shoot his gun off and then if you're like 77 dudes in a fucking riot sitting next to each other and you hear a gun go off like yeah. your first instinct is and to pull your gun then also to pull your gun and yeah. shoot so there, when I was researching this, I, there were for a really brief second, I because I was really weirded out by the fact that they sat down by that fence for ten minutes, and yeah. I was like, "Did they plan this? Like, did they like go in and they were walking up because of the way that they were looking at the students, yeah. turning and looking at the students?" And it was like, "Did they, like, did this group, like, plan something?" Yeah, I mean, you don't know, and 
It's all speculation. All yeah. speculation. Um, but I think it was just like, if the one guy is telling the truth and he heard a gun being fired at him or if he was shot at, which I don't necessarily believe that he was, mm-hmm. um, I understand the other guys around him in for fear of their lives because they claimed that they were in fear of their life. But these people were really far away from them. Like the closest person was 71 feet. And I think the furthest person away was almost 500 feet. Oh, sorry. 750 feet away. Mm -hmm. Like these weren't people, they weren't fucking advancing on you. They were far enough away that you shouldn't have been in fear of your life. Especially if you're the one sitting there with a rifle Mm -hmm. in full armor, like whatever, but they claimed fear of life. So, um, others, so they testified that someone had shot upon the guardsmen. Others testified that they were in fear of their lives, but it was de- debated because of how far away the students were. Um, of those wounded, no one was closer than 71 feet. Mm-hmm. Um, and of the ones, of the people that were killed, uh, Miller, the closest person was Miller at 225 feet and the average, and the furthest away was, uh, 345. Mm-hmm. So it's just like the ones that you killed they weren't coming for you. Yeah. Especially the ones that weren't even a part of the protest that they were just leaving class. Like we still have school shootings and like, yeah. it's so, and these kids, I mean, are... th- this is, this is obviously different. Like these were like national guard. Yeah. This, this isn't like a kid going around killing other kids. This is like the government who you trust to take yeah. care of you. The people who are supposed to keep the peace. Yeah. Uh, disrupted the peace. Yeah. Uh, so immediately after the shootings, many angry students uh, were ready to lodge an all attack on the National Guard. Um, and many faculty members was like, no, you need to fucking you need to stop. You don't give in to this because once they saw all the blood, all the dead kids, they like they went for it. They were gone. One of the faculty members, uh, Glenn Frank, uh, he said uh, he's quoted as saying, I don't care whether you've never listened to it anyone before in your lives i'm begging you right now if you don't disperse right now they're going to move in and it's going to be a slaughter just please listen to me i don't want to be a part of this jesus christ just go mm-hmm. and it's just like in this is it's really is one of those things like if you have never listened to anybody before you need to get out the people that were still there like i just like i can't imagine what it was like um so after 20 minutes of these like faculty members like like you guys need to go they finally dispersed uh all of the commons um and ambulance personnel tended to the wounded and the national guard left the area um and uh professor frank's son uh who was present that day said uh he absolutely saved my life and hundreds of others um so good job uh professor frank Mm -hmm. he did good um, photographs of the dead and the wounded at Kent State started getting distributed because we don't, like, have this, any sort of class. Well, on, on top of that, they're trying to incite an anger in people yeah. to get people on their side. Well, I mean, this is upsetting. Like, they went and killed students. Yeah. So, like, it was this like, will... fuck this war. You're yeah. killing protesters for your war now? And like, just random students? Yeah. So, um... And then, so they know, like... Yeah, it's a really shitty thing to just show, like, a dead person who doesn't deserve their body to be shown like that. But at the same time, they're, like, you're trying to incite an anger in everyone else so they can understand, like, why everyone else is so angry. Uh, So, worldwide, uh, people grow angry at the U.S. invasions into Cambodia and the Vietnam War in general. Like, people were just like, what are you doing? Yeah. And And how shitty is it that people only cared after students started dying? Well, I'm sure they killed. They cared before. Did, but they, did they care when the entire village were, was fucking destroyed? You know what I mean? Well, yes, they did because that's what caused this. No, but I mean like the other countries are well, mad about. I, it's very possible that they also could have been oh. because like that came out on the 30th of April. April 30th. Yeah, and this was... And then they had the, the first uh, protest for it. On the first, so yeah. this all all of this protest in is May, from yeah. the May Lai massacre. Yeah, so that's like what a, they're it's protesting. A, it's like an addition. So America went in and killed all these fucking people, and then this high, then this college it's like, protested it, the and fuck? then they went and killed students at that protest. Yeah. So it was just like the world got angry. Yeah. Um. And I'm sitting here getting angry, and <laughs> this 
happened like yeah. 40, 50 years ago. 50, holy shit. So there was 50. one photo. Uh, it ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize. It was taken uh, by Kent State photojournalist student uh, John Philo, and it was of a 14-year-old girl named Mary Ann Vichow who was screaming over the dead body of Jeffrey Miller. Uh, who had just been shot in the mouth. And oh it was, like, gosh. his girlfriend or, like, a girl that had just been sort of passing by. Yeah. And uh, that was the photo that basically got broadcasted everywhere. Uh, it became the most enduring image of the event and uh, one of the most enduring images of the anti-Vietnam War movement. Yeah. Uh, the shootings led to protests on other college campuses throughout the United States and a student strike, causing more than 4 million students to protest and 40... 450 campuses across the country to close with both violent and nonviolent demonstrations. Um, and the Kent State campus remained closed for six weeks. And I thought that that was ridiculously short. Like it's, six weeks is not a long time. Yeah, That's but, not even a long enough time for you to go through your fucking criminal proceedings. But universities like, are all about money too. Yeah. So you can't, like you can't punish the long. other students and yeah. stuff, I guess. Um, so students at New York University hung a banner outside a window that read, they can't kill us all, uh, which, no, they fucking can't. Like, there was no way that they were going to, What were the, I mean, not that they were going to go to any of their schools and start shooting. I I'm kind of scared that, like, nowadays they would consider it. Uh, I don't know. I don't think we're there yet. I think, like, right before we get to, like, uh, The Handmaiden's Tale. Yeah. I think that's, I so. that's when they start. Oh, I, yeah. They'll for sure, you fucking die or you you join. Like, what, yeah. are, like, what are people going to do? Who's going to come and save Americans? Canada, probably. Canada won't anymore. Well, maybe not so much anymore. Jesus. <laughs> um, on May 8th, uh, 11 people were bayoneted at the University of New Mexico by the New Mexico National Guard in a confrontation with student protesters. Because, again, like, because now all these other fucking campuses are protesting. Um, uh, also on May 8th, an anti-war protest at New York Federal's Hall National Memorial held at least partly in reaction to the Kent State uh, killings was met with a counter rally of pro-Nixon construction workers uh, resulting in the hard hat riot, which I didn't look that up because, but I should have, cause it sounds so cool. Yeah. Um, but maybe I'll look in, if someone died in that, I'll look that up. It's like a blue collar <laughs> thing, but yeah. Yeah. Um, the following day. 100,000 people demonstrated uh, on Washington, D.C. against the war and the killings of the unarmed student protesters. Um, and, like, the president was taken to Camp David yeah. for two days for his own safety. Uh -huh. um, but the Charles Colson, who was counsel to President Nixon, um, he stated that the military was called up to protect the Nixon administration from angry students. He recalled that the 82nd Airborne was in the basement. Um, and it was just like, really? Like, these students just got shot by your fucking National Guard, and then you're going to like be all like, oh, the president's in danger from these students. They're so bad. Well, yeah, because, I mean, look at these dangerous students yeah. who died. Look how dangerous they, they died. That's how dangerous they were. Yeah, he was quoted as saying, like, this can't be the United States of America. No. This is not the greatest free democracy in the world. This nation is at war within itself. And it's like, yeah, and it had never fucking stopped. Uh, President Nixon and his administration's public reaction to the shootings was perceived by many as the anti-war, in the anti-war movement as callous. Because, like, he didn't fucking, he was, like, pretending indifference. It's very, like, it's the exact same shit with Trump. Like, where you go up there and you say shit that like where you're sort of need to say it but like everybody knows that you don't actually mean it because you're using certain words yeah why are you still making noise uh okay so a poll was taken immediately after the students and it was reported that 60 percent of americans blamed the students for what happened mm -hmm. uh only 11 percent blamed the national guard and the remaining expressed no opinion yeah um and it was like that was like the big thing afterwards is that they all blamed the students they said that uh, the students who were shot wasn't a bad thing. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it's just so fucking gross. Uh, students from Kent State and other universities uh, often got a hostile reaction upon returning home. Uh, they were told that more students should have been killed to teach the student protesters a lesson. Good. Uh, and yep. some students were even disowned by their families because, you know. And these people what? are the people voting now. Yeah. I just don't understand They're the people how... making the laws now. Yeah, I'm so confused on 
how you can live through this. I don't know. On May 14th, 10 days after the Kent State shooting, uh, two students were killed and 12 were wounded by police at Jackson State University under similar circumstances, uh, which is called the Jackson State killings. But that event didn't arouse the same nationwide attention as the Kent State shootings because... It was not it the was, first one. It wasn't the first one. Yeah. Okay, so where was I? Let's backtrack a little bit. <laughs> delete, 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 delete. <coughs> yeah. Cough. Okay, yeah, so a bunch of schools, and then they had the Jackson State killing. So on June 13th, 1970, as the consequence of the killings for protesting students at Jack, at Kent State, in Jackson State, uh, President Nixon established the President's Commission of Campus Unrest, known as the Scranton Commission. Uh, the commission issued its findings in 1970 in a report that concluded that the Ohio National Guard shooting was unjustified. Oh, what a fucking for shocker. Reals? Even though. Um, I, you know what? Nowadays, though, they would they would play it off because like so much of the country agreed that it was a student's fault, so they would just be like, "Yeah, it was a student's fault." Now yeah. they wouldn't even fucking fast up to it. Okay, so the report said that even though the guardsmen faced danger, it was not a danger that called for lethal force. 68, 61 shots by 28 guardsmen certainly cannot be justified. Apparently, no order to fire was given, and there was inadequate fire control discipline on the Blanket Hill. The Kent State tragedy must mark the last time that, as a matter of course, loaded rifles are issued to guardsmen confronting student demonstrators. So basically, they're like, you can't take rifles to colleges anymore. No fucking like, shit. Like Unless that. there's an active shooter on campus, you shouldn't that. be taking rifles. No. Um, in September 1970, 24 students and one faculty member identified from photographs uh, were indicted on charges connected to the May 4th demonstration um, of the RTC building fire three days before. Uh, they became known as the Kent 25. Five cases all related to the burning of the building went to trial. One non-student defendant was convicted on one charge uh, and was convicted on one charge and two other non-students pleaded guilty. One of other offended was acquitted and the charges were dismissed against the last. In uh, 1971, all charges against the remaining 20 students were dismissed with lack of evidence. So basically everybody, well, one student one was person, charged. Yeah. Um, the other two were pleaded guilty, but they got acquitted or dismissed. So yeah. all, like one person was basically went to jail. Yeah. For the bur that was for the burning of the building. Um, eight of the guardsmen, so eight of the 28 yep. people were indicted by a grand jury. The guardsmen's claim to have fired in self-defense, uh, the, a claim that was at the time generally accepted and the criminal justice system. Um, in 1974, the U S district judge, uh, Frank Battisti, uh, dismissed the civil rights charges against all eight of the all eight of them on the basis that the prosecution's case was too weak to warrant a trial. Uh -huh. So they got released. So, so no one, no, only one kid got punished for the yeah. whole thing. Um, so civil the actions people killed people, killed innocent students, but one person was charged for burning down the building. Yep. That sounds about right. Yep. Uh, so civil actions were also attempted against the guardsmen by this, or, against the guardsmen, the state of Ohio, and the president of Kent State. Uh, the federal court action for a wrongful death and injury brought on by the victims and their families against Governor Rhodes, the president of Kent State and the National Guardsmen, resulted in unanimous verdicts for all of the defendants on all claims after an 11-week trial. The judgment was of those verdicts, however, were reversed in the Court of Appeals yeah. uh, on the ground that the federal trial judge had mishandled the out of an out-of-court threat against a juror. Uh, on reprimand, on remand, sorry, not reprimand, the civil case was settled in return of a payment of $675,000 to all plaintiffs in, by the state of Ohio. Um, and the defendants uh, agreed to state publicly that they regretted what happened. Like, so, yeah. They got, like, a slap on the wrist. Yeah, they and had, they were like, yeah. The state of Ohio had to pay money. Yeah. So the taxpayers had to pay money. Yeah. So right. this was the statement of the defendants. Mm -hmm. In retrospect, the tragedy of May 4th, 1970 should not have occurred. The students may have believed that they were in their right to continuing their mass protest in response to the Cambodian invasion, even though this protest followed the posting and the reading 
followed was followed by a posting and reading by the University of an order to ban rallies and order to disperse. These orders should have been determined uh, by the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals as lawful because they came back and said, oh, no, no. Yeah. So there were like some students should have like, I'm sure they believe that they were supposed to be there, but they shouldn't have been. Oh, my God. And these guards, you know, they really believe that they were uh -huh. in fear of their lives given, you know, yep. the prior events. And, you know, in hindsight, another way should have. You know, they should have handled that a little bit differently, but they didn't. I mean, they didn't. And it's just like, it's such a fucking, like, yeah, they regretted. They stated that they regretted what happened, but they never fucking took any, like, responsibility. It's, politics. it's That's how politics trash. works. Because they're still blaming the students. Yeah, that's how politics works. <sighs> so, uh, as a little finish, uh, in 2007... One of the wound now this is weird. So in 2007, one of the wounded students, Alan Can Canfora, he's uh, up in Yale li the Yale Library. Yeah, and he finds an audio tape of the shootings. And I'm thinking, like when I read this, I was like, Why would why there, there be an audio, audio tape at Yale? Yeah, like, uh, so he finds this audio tape of the shootings in the Yale Library archives. Yeah. And it was a 30-minute reel-to-reel audio recording made by Terry Strube, who was a Kent State communications student, uh, who just happened to turn on his recorder and put his microphone out the dormitory window uh, overlooking the campus. Uh-huh. Alan claimed that an amplified version of the tape reveals the order to shoot, right here, get set, point, fire. Oh. And uh, in 2010... They do an audio analysis of the tape, um, and it by so Stuart Allen and Tom Owen do an analysis, and they were described as um, uh, nationally respected forensic audio experts. So some experts come in, and they concluded that the guardsmen were given an order to fire. Yep. Uh, further analysis of the audio tape refer, refer to what sounded like four pistol shots, and a confrontation occurred approximately seventy seconds before the National Guard opened fire. So, like, the four shots get set off, uh -huh. then it's point, shoot, fire. Yeah. But what's weird is that, like, not a lot of people had heard those the first, the four, four. The first yeah. four shots. Especially with their 70 seconds between the first four yeah. shots and then the next ones. Um, a new analysis. So then they did another analysis uh, of it. And um, because they... Oh, sorry. The new analysis raised questions about the role of Terry Norman, uh, who was a state Kent State student who was an FBI informant and was known for carry, and was known to carry a pistol during the disturbance. So yeah. that's when it um, there was I I sort of left it out, but uh, during like all those years, uh, there was they came about like the student who was an FBI informant, and so they were like, oh, he had something to do with it. No, he didn't have anything to do with it. Oh, he had something to do with it, and it was yeah. a big cover up because that's how they do. Uh, so we don't really know who what Terry Norman was doing. Yeah. Um, but it's very possible that he had uh, gone there with his gun and that he was the first person to shoot. Uh, yeah. Open fire. Uh, in April 2012, the United States Department of Justice determined that there were insurmountable legal and evidentiary barriers to opening the reopening the case. Uh -huh. So they didn't, and it's just sort of like. What what is the insurmountable illegal evidentiary barriers? Like what what can't you get past as the FBI? What can't the FBI get past when it comes to some legal barriers? And what kind of legal barriers were put up with this fucking case that you can't reopen it? Because there was Because there was a, a cover up. Of course. Ugh. So Well, um, I mean who fucking knows, right? There might be so much red tape that they just didn't want to fucking bother because they're like, Well, it was like forty years ago, who cares? Yeah, which so is, which is how people are, which yeah. is really shitty. So in 2012, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice is like, "No, we can't reopen this case." Then the FBI concludes that the tape was inconclusive, uh, and they try to say that the pistol shots that they heard, the the four of them, uh, could have just been slamming doors and voices heard uh, from the hallway because he was recording in his dorm. Yeah. So they they were like, "Oh, that's just four slamming doors." At this. Like, at that, like, sure. Yeah. sure. 
Uh, despite this, organizations of the survivors and Kent State students continue to believe that the tape proves that the guardsmen that the guardsmen were given military order to fire, especially because so many people had said like they got down on their knees. Yeah. So that was an order, and that could have been arranged when they were over by that fence for that ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, the organizations, uh, they uh, didn't want to prosecute or sue any individual guardsmen because they believe that they were also victims. Um, and, yeah, so they haven't, yeah. So, yeah, so they didn't uh, go back and do anything. So that is the Kent State Massacre of 2000 and, sorry, that is the Kent State Massacre of 1970. Yes. Yeah. That's my story. People are gonna like see how long this story is and be like, oh. I listen to podcasts for two hours all the time, so yeah. I don't it, care. It's not gonna be so bad. It'll, like the podcast itself is probably gonna be like two hours. Which, yeah, whatever. Two hours isn't that bad. That's what I, it, I leave this to was a to. really long one. All right, so I'll get to my story, which is more recent in the two thousands. So. I'm going to start this off by painting you a picture of a really mundane day. So you may have actually heard the story, and then you can chime in when you recognize it. Okay. Because I'm pretty sure you have. All right. So let me paint you. I don't you have a, a very good memory, though. I think, like, when you hear the story, okay. you're going to, yeah. Okay. So let me paint you a picture. I'm going to buzz in. So Peter Porco, age 52, an Appleton Division court clerk, woke up on November 15th, 2004, not knowing it would be the last morning he would be alive. Okay, so a, a clerk? Just a up. court clerk woke court clerk. up, okay. didn't realize this is the last morning he's ever okay. going to be alive. Oh, so dramatic. He did his usual Monday morning routine of using the bathroom, loaded the dishwasher, packs his lunch, signs checks for a few parking tickets his son occurred, went to the porch to get a newspaper, and realized he locked himself out. He oh, went shit. for a hidden key under the potted plant to let himself back in without disturbing his wife. He gets a little dizzy, and he takes a seat before taking his final resting place on the floor near the stairway. I'm sorry. Are you talking to me about Tylenol murder? <laughs> <laughs> Did I not mention that the entire time he had an axe lodged into his head? <gasps> Do you recognize this murder? I kind of... I kind of do. I'm not. So this is the guy where. Okay, yeah, where he there gets was, up. Yeah, okay. and then like there's blood all over the house. And then the cops are like, what the fuck happened? Because there's blood everywhere. Like he walked around. And he doesn't at all see the blood. He doesn't see it. And he like loads a dishwasher and he washes his hands after using the I mean, bathroom. And there's blood everywhere around the house. I mean, if it like. It's just in his I'm sorry, head. Sorry, he has it in his head. Okay, so it's it just lodged wow. in his head. Okay, so he sits down, and then okay. he gets dizzy, and okay. then he falls to his death, like from the chair, because he oh, the blood loss. Did you tell me this story? No, I feel like this was this was very briefly mentioned in my favorite murder. In okay. the latest episode, like the sort of latest ish. Because episode. I haven't, I haven't listened to the most recent ones. Oh, she just someone, someone mentioned else, someone else. Must a, have. Yeah, but it's like a pretty, like no one else fucking walked okay, around with an axe in their head. I'm thinking like the girlfriend did it, right? Or the no. Husband. Okay, anyways, okay. doesn't matter. You so tell me. Joan Joan Porco, his wife, is a children's speech speech pathologist, and she's discovered lying in the couple's blood drenched, like the the couple's blood drenched bed. And has severe head trauma. Okay, so the wife is so dead. also been attacked. Oh, shit. Her okay, skull... well, it's definitely not the wife. I thought it was the wife. Yeah. Her skull had been axed open, her oh, jaw shit. broken, and she was missing teeth and an eye. Was it the son? Where's the son? So the attack was done with an axe that belonged to the family and was found in the couple's bedroom. When Wait. the detective... Because, like, that was a murder okay. weapon. Yeah. So when Detective Bowdish, the detective on the case, asked Joan at this time if she knew who did it, she nodded. Because she was somehow still alive. What? She wasn't even dead yet? No. Holy fuck. As family members are usually the prime suspect in these kinds of cases, the detective first asked if it was her son, Jonathan, a 23-year-old naval officer stationed in North Carolina. She said no. She shook her head no. When they asked if it was her younger son, 
Christopher, Christopher Porco, a 21-year-old student at the University of Rochester, 230 miles away, she nodded her head yes. Whoa. She was in such serious condition, the detective Bowdish believed her statement might qualify for dying declaration. But or she... maybe he was just a cop who was like, yes, it was the sun, and I believe it, and now I'm going to make sure that it's the sun, and I'm going to... She it. lives, <gasps> by the way. She lives? Yes. Oh, my gosh. So um, when Dude, Joan woke from her coma, I really hope it wasn't her she had no recollection of the incident and denied ever saying Christopher was her attacker. It's been speculated that because of her, of her identifying Christopher as her attacker when, you know, she was severely hurt, mm-hmm. the police pursued Christopher instead of conducting a broader investigation yep. of potential suspects, which yep. is what you're worried about. Oh, for sure. So let's focus on the main suspect of this crime, Christopher po- Porco. Oh, my God. Does it end up being the other son? That'd be so crazy. It's He's in South Carolina. It's like a thousand miles away. So this kid's over in Rochester. Two. 230 miles away. That's so? I mean, well, that's still like a couple hours drive. So I'm going to build you the story. Okay, build me the story. Okay. Build me the story, Angela. So he was born July 9th, 1983, which means he's not much older than us. And he was I'm a sorry, student. 1983? Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yes. Not much older than us. I mean, it's a, it's a good amount. So Christopher was a student at the University of Rochester. On November 2002... Two years before the murder at the Porco home, Detective Bowdish came to their residence after Joan and Peter reported a break-in with two laptops being stolen. It was, so this was so the, this was this, two years before the murder. So the two years before the murder, the same cop shows up for like for yeah this. for a random That's break-in. Suspicious. It was later to have been found that Christopher had sold these two laptops on eBay. Oh, so Christopher did it? Yeah. So this this cop was already out for Christopher fucking for two mm-hmm. years. Christopher had been going around campus showing off his wealth that he claimed he had access to due to his grandmother being a rich landlord, landowner, which he didn't have. This wasn't true. So to continue his facade, he also had his father, Peter, lend him $2,000 to buy books, which what? he didn't. Yeah. With this information that he got, you know, because when he got the money for it, I'm assuming he was able to get, like, you know, credit card statements or something. Christopher was able to take out a much bigger loan of $23,000, forging Peter's signature as his co-signer. Okay. Yeah. So he went and got some signature. He he took the signatures yeah. from that money transfer. So in the fall of 2003, the University of Rochester had forced Christopher to withdraw due to his poor grades because he wasn't doing too well in school he was able to gain readmission by forging a transcript from hudson's valley community college because if you fail out you can go to community college and if you get really good grades they'll let you back in yeah and so it's speculated that he just forged transcripts from there and was able to get back in so christopher was trying to pay for his fall 2004 tuition with a loan he had taken out Okay. Uh, like the $31,000. I mean, at least he's still trying to pay for school. But then he, the thing is that he had previously lied to his parents, saying that he didn't really fail school. It was just a misunderstanding with the professor, and he, the professor had misplaced the final exam, so he's not going to have to pay for this new semester Listen, let, the all, previous year. We've all been there. Yeah. We've all been there. We've all lied for our parents but all money. But gets, he gets really douchey. So um, two weeks before his murder... You know, P- Peter's murder. Peter emailed Christopher about the situation. He said, did you forge my signature as a cosigner? What the hell are you doing? You should call me to discuss it. I'm calling City Bank this morning to find out what you've done, and I'm going to tell them I'm not to be on it as a cosigner because you can't forge your parents' signature and steal yeah. money from them. Sorry about that, bro. And he had previously had been calling Christopher, but obviously Christopher is ignoring his dad because, yeah, he knows he's in deep shit. So the following day, Citibank notified Peter of a line of credit that was taken out to finance a yellow Jeep. Oh, shit. Yep. So a Peter now, once... Does that yellow Jeep show up in that neighborhood? Yeah. In the night of the killing. So Peter once again emailed Christopher as he had been ignoring his parents' calls for the last past few weeks. I want you to know that if you abuse my credit again, I'll be forced to file forgery affidavits in order to disclaim liability and that 
applied to the Citibank college loan if you attempt to reactivate it or use my credit to obtain any other loan. Basically, mm -hmm. like, back off. Yeah, stop using stop using my credit. Yeah. Like, listen, you little puke. I gave you all this shit. Stop stealing from me. So then <laughs> the email concluded with, we may be disappointed with you, but your mother and I still love you and care about your future. So it seemed like if Christopher yeah. just came to his parents and was just like, hey, I need some fucking help with what's going on here. Yeah, it's just like you can't keep Dad. doing this. Like you, if you keep doing this, you're going to like, I'm going to have to do this. Like you, you're hurting your mother. Yeah. You're making your mama cry. I don't want your mama to cry anymore. Come home, son. Exactly. Come home. <laughs> so on Just the leave school, it's clearly not working for you. So on the day of, um, you know, his parents, like his the, the attack that happened, um, when Christopher was asked about his alibi, he claimed that on no November fourteenth, he fell asleep in the dormitory lounge, and woke up the next morning, finding out from the news what happened to his parents, because his parents, or like his dad was found dead on in the morning on November fifteenth, so it must have happened during that night time. So they asked yeah. him when he was in it, the, the, the night before. So yeah. Chris, and he was like, "I was just in my dorm. I slept, and I woke up, and, and then, my yeah. parents had died in the news." And Christopher's classmates, or sorry, Christopher's housemates, claimed that they were not with him, so he wasn't there. While a two hundred and thirty mile distance may sound like a good alibi, since Christopher was already back on campus when his parents were discovered. And has been seen the previous night because, you know, he was seen on campus before. It's plausible for him to make the three plus hour drive to his parents' home in Albany in the early morning. Because it's only three hours each way. Yeah, but. And I it mean, only takes an hour to get like bludgeon someone, right? So it's seven hours. If you do it, you know, yeah, it is plausible. But I mean, that's like under the intention that like under the mindset that he went there to. I mean, and yeah. it's very possible he did. I mean, because it seems like this the story being built against him seemed pretty good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you've got like your black sheep in the family. Yeah, who, uh, steal you have, like, shit, stealing shit. You have the father that's like, "Hey, stop!" Or I'm gonna like have to press charges, and then the parents show up dead. So I understand why they went. And then on top of that, four security cameras on campus recorded a yellow Jeep Wrangler like Christopher's leaving the campus at 10.30 p.m. on November 14th and returning at 8.30 a.m. November 15th. Mm, that's not good, buddy. See where this all... No. It just, could there have been more than one yellow Jeep? With it's, yellow a very, Jeep? it's a very distinctive yellow Jeep. Not yeah, but I mean, of, like... Yeah. But was, like, a yellow Jeep the thing? Because you know how, like, right now it's, like, the purple Jeep. They have got the purple Jeep, and that's, like, the thing for this year. And so I was, like, were it's, there yellow Apparently Jeeps it popular? was very distinctive. It was it was kind of yeah. more of a one-of-a-kind thing. And okay. there's more. Okay. So fingerprints were not recovered from the fire axe found at the scene of the crime. Gloves. And there were several sightings of the distinctive yellow Jeep along the way as well as recovered toll receipts with his fingerprints on them during the time frame that would match Christopher perpetrating the okay. crime. Yeah. So I'm, then I'm, I'm not on your side anymore. Christopher. <laughs> I was really rooting for you, but it's starting to, cause I, I was watching, to add up. I was watching it takes a killer and that's when they mentioned it. So I, I didn't see it in the Wikipedia, but that's like, I was watching a TV show and that's when they mentioned that they had actually gone through all the ticket tolls and found one of his and then the thing was that like he had one of those passes you know like the beeper yeah. like fast track things he had one of those but it seemed like he hid it and that way it wouldn't beep because it'll be too obvious like they just track it and be like oh well you fucking went through the toll but mm -hmm. if you pay cash you won't get yeah. caught and it's probably in the dad's name yeah because it most likely is yeah sons. <laughs> so i mean after that it's like well if you go through all the ticket toll like yeah. slip things and then you find his fingerprint in one of them then oh it doesn't look good that, for you that's a lot that's a lot of ticket holes they would have had to go through yeah to, and how many fingerprints they would have had, had to, to lift yeah so that's yeah, why that's i was like how long Ex did that take extensive but this was happened in 2004. Mm -hmm. In August 10th, 2006, two years after, okay. which is probably why it took so long, yeah. Christopher was found guilty of second-degree murder and attempted murder of okay, his mother. Okay, so that's not when he actually got charged. That's when he was found guilty. Yes. Okay. How so, how long do, do you happen to have when he was arrested? Like, no. Okay. So on December 12th, 2006, Judge Jeffrey Berry sentenced Christopher to 50 years to life on each count 
totaling to a minimum of 50 years because it sounds like it's concurrent or yeah mm-hmm. so he said i fear very much what happened in the early morning of november 12th is something that could happen again even though i'm pretty sure this was november 15th but i probably worked <laughs> on the name wrong anyways joan continues to insist that christopher couldn't have possibly perpetrated this crime she said, yeah, yeah. I implore the Bethlehem Police and District Attorney's Office to leave my son alone and to search for Peter's real killer or killers so he can rest in peace and my sons and I can live safely. Because you're like, like, that's her son. Yeah, she can't believe that her son did this. Yeah. Like, and she, she, can't. she is permanently disfigured, by the way. Yeah. So I obviously, imagine yeah. Her head had a chunk missing out of it because he took it. With that X. Mm-hmm. So here is the alternative that Christopher's lawyers came up with. There was some speculation built by the defense attorney Terrence Kindlin that this could have been the work of Frank Porco, Peter's uncle. Terrence is he of all people he blamed the uh, uncle. Yeah. It's not even like he blamed a like a stranger or anything like that. He's like, no, it's my uncle. Yeah. So this is because not Terrence. Frank is a captain in the Bonanno crime family who spent okay. two years in jail for loan sharking and extortion. Frank's, Frank's nickname in the mob was the fireman and served in the New York City Fire Department. And the axe found in Peter's head was a fire axe. That was the only connection. The fact that his nickname was the fireman and it was a fire axe. No. That was a connection they he the tried. Was, he was trying it, to build. The guy was into extorting. That, yeah. There's a big jump from extorting to murder. There was never a connection found between Frank and the murders. But you know what isn't a big jump? Uh, stealing and forgery because in a lot of the murders I've had. They, Money they, people, related. Like, they, they usually start with forgery <laughs> and stealing. And, then, and then that's. Somehow that devolves into murder. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I can't believe how short that was. Right? Like. <laughs> I told you my this, story would be short to make up for your story. <laughs> my story, I listeners, I'm so sorry that you just had to listen to like two hours of me rambling and then like five minutes of Angela just like, this is my really quick murder. <laughs> I wanted to end with something a little more, it wasn't like lighthearted, but it was kind of like, like you imagine it like with this guy walking around with an axe. No, that's like super upsetting that he walked around his whole house with an axe in his head. Yeah, um, and then like it's detectives. It's, it's weird. It's like really weird that like he didn't see anything, and it's also like, like what was his brain doing? Like what was he actually I think seeing? A lot of people were saying that your brain was in autopilot mode. Yeah, and that's what happened. Yeah, he was probably like just like, but I mean, he sat down and he wrote checks. Yeah, for like for, for his, his son, son that murdered. Now, murdered him. did he actually write the checks, or did the son write the checks? For tickets, probably he did. It was just like part, like speeding tickets. Or he tickets. was probably. Do you think the son showed up and then he was all just like, "I need money for the whatever." Like, if you give me just like write these for these parking tickets or whatever the fuck, like I promise I'll leave you alone. Like, why? Maybe. Why would the dad who had just told him like stop forging my name? We can't like blah blah. blah we're not doing this anymore. Then write. My, I think it's different checks. to like, especially like legal if- things over just this kid wanting to steal a ton of money. Or maybe he's just used to it. Maybe he or maybe a lot he forged of... those checks. I think yeah. he forged the checks. But that's not the real important part. The important part is like he axed his parents. Like yeah, that's that is obviously a the checks physical feat. But yeah, w- between ten thirty a.m. and eight thirty a.m., which is like and you would met, and it probably wasn't a situation where he did. Obviously, he went and had his talk with this kid because it sort of seems like he entered the house, attacked the wife. Yeah, attacked the dad. And it seems, but the dad, uh, it was probably just like, it seems like he raged on his mom. Yeah, because he did, and then he, and then he probably like just hit his dad once and just thought, hey, you know what, this is enough, and then like left, but like lodged the axe into his head, and he did, he did end up killing his dad, not his mom. That's so, so yeah. yeah see, for for me, it's a little weird that he did the dad first because you would think that he would do. But sorry, he sorry, his... sorry, 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 that he did the mom first because you would think, like, me and my little murder brain, uh, you would think that he would do the dad because if he did the mom, the dad would have woken up. You would think the mom would wake up and then 
Um, so I thought what happened was that he had two axes because, you know, there, they found one in the bedroom and then they had one in dad. So I think what he did was he axed the dad first, but then the axe got lodged into his head and he figured that was good enough and then went for his mom immediately after. And then just, like, hit her more than once? Because it kept coming maybe, out. Maybe it didn't like, lodge in, like, the dad. Yeah. And that's why. Like, maybe, yeah. And then, it, and maybe he two, didn't hit her you know as hard. What? Two, two axes might, might make sense. But yeah. it's just like, and he just didn't hit it, his mom as hard because she she survived. So. And did he bring the axes with them? No, they were at the house already because he lives yeah. there, so he yeah, would know true. where the axes are. True, 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 yeah. true. true. So yeah, I like I was watching uh, it takes a killer episode, and I was like this guy. And then it was just they just talked about the murder really quickly. But then I looked it up, and that's when I found out it was the axe in the brain one. So they couldn't. So I guess no, they wouldn't really have the time of death for the dad would have been like at X amount of time. They couldn't like figure out any sort of timeline like with like blood splatter on the walls or anything like that. I think they just kind of like they knew it was an early morning. So uh, when the attack happened, he left at ten o'clock at night, and it's and three hours. There. So yeah. between like one and two a.m. Yeah, and then when the attack happens even at three a.m. He would still have a lot of time to get back. Yeah, because he would need to be out of there by by five. Yeah, to be back at the campus yeah. for eight. Like let's just say four thirty-five. Cause yeah, traffic. So just say he did the attack at three a.m., which is very plausible. Then yeah, but then the fact that That's like so upsetting. the fact that like this man walked outside with an axe in his head and got his newspaper. Yeah, locked himself out. Somehow remembered in like part of his brain, like, oh, a key is under a potted plant. And like, imagine if you're a neighbor and you saw this, you would just think it was like a joke. You know what I mean? Like, if I saw like someone with an axe in their head, I would assume it was like makeup or a Halloween like, prank or something. So, who was the one that found him? I'm assume like. I'm I'm assuming it just says detectives found them. So I'm assuming like, like the neighbor, the neighbor like, might have seen. Out on the porch yeah. And was like, oh, like <laughs> no. Imagine? Or imagine like if I maybe like the door was open and then like. Well, because wasn't saw. he? Sit, didn't he like get up and he just sat, sat down, down and on, then like, yeah, on, and on then the fell. Porch, so no, he didn't. He fell in the in like in the house. He yeah, was in the house. In front okay, of the I thought area. I thought he was outside. Yeah. So yeah, maybe the door was like left open. Yeah. Maybe the other. I don't. That's so. That's upsetting. Or maybe like one of them didn't show for work, so then one of their friends. It definitely was the son. It was the son, though. It was the son. Yeah. Um, and then you feel so bad for the mom because I'm just like, of course she's gonna. She's gonna be side. full in denial, like yeah. full in denial. I couldn't even imagine. That's. I just thought it was just so interesting. But that was that was my story. <laughs> so well, sure. thanks for telling me the story, man. All right, guys. Well, that's it for this episode of People Keep Dying. We hope that you are around next week for the next episode. So just don't, don't die before then. Yeah, we hope you don't die uh, between now and the next one. All right. Bye. Bye.